as you are making your way back to your seat, if you would take out your Bible, whatever version of that you use, whether it's got paper involved or digital connection. How many of you guys have gone all electronic? You haven't touched a printed Bible in weeks. Let me just see your hand. Really? Come on. All, you can admit it. It's all right. I use an electric one too. I know. I do. I know. It's, it's controversial. But don't give up. I'm, I'm still going to complain and take every shot I can against everything electronic. Electronics hate me. Electronic, anybody who works with me knows this. The electronic world is assigned demons to me. So if there's anything in my life that involves electronics, it is not going to operate the same way for me as it does for anybody else. It just is a fact. No. All right, well, open to Exodus chapter... 14, and there's some, just some great insights here from the Lord that are going to find their way into the everyday moments of our lives, and they're also going to inform us of something that we are always desperately in need of. We are called to live our lives in a universe created by God and created for God's purpose, and so who this God is and what he's like is going to have a huge influence in how do you go about living your life, All right? So there, there really isn't or shouldn't be a human being who has been created by God who's seeking to create a personal storyline that doesn't take into account the creator, right? Otherwise, there's no way to live a, a life that's got purpose in it. And so this passage is going to take us into some insights about God that uh, again, it's going to be an awkward angle to approach, I'll warn you in advance, but it's, it's extremely helpful and important in the spaces of our lives in which we live. So we're going we're gonna to start reading in verse 10 of chapter 14. And this is a, a world famous event, right? Exodus 14 takes us to the Red Sea and to one of the most spoken about miracles in all of Scripture the parting of the Red Sea and the rescue of God's people and the overcoming of their enemy in this event. But I want us to focus on something that's part of this story that gets overlooked almost every time it's read, and it has to do with the fear that is in this story. Fear begins in a certain place, and fear is going to end in a certain place. And it's going to be important that we understand what happens and even why this event, I think, is here. So let's start in verse 10. Exodus 14. It says, When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Fear not. Stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry land. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots, and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. 
Then the angel of God who was going before the host of Israel moved and went behind them and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning, in the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. I'm not going to tweak that point out, but did you just learn something about God just by reading that one statement? Now, you, you may have learned something. If, you're, if your best friend is an Egyptian, you just learned something that's very awkward. These are, people avoid reading things in Scripture that they don't like. Now, if your best friend's an Israelite, you love that idea. God fights for the Israelites. But part of reading that passage also informed you about something. He doesn't fight for the Egyptians the way he fights for the Israelites. So you just learned something about God. I'm not saying you like it, but it is what God has done. Verse 26, then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the sea turned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen of all the host of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians, so the people feared the Lord. And they believed in the Lord and in his servant, Moses. Well, Lord, these are words you have preserved for us. Lord, they benefit who we are made to be because they teach us about who you are. And so, God, would you open our hearts? God, would you give us understanding? Would you allow us to see things that have a heavenly perspective about them? And you might affect our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is, a, this is a bit of, I mean, it's a very famous event here. And I'm actually not going to live in the event. I want to live on the two edges of the event. Because it's almost like a, a fear sandwich here. Right? In the beginning of this story, we, we kind of zoom in to the people of Israel. And they are in a panic. They are freaking out. They have lifted up their eyes. And behold, they have seen something. Which, by the way, fear always needs to see something. I right? got a little lesson on fear in this chapter. Fear needed to see that there was all these chariots and all these horses and all of Pharaoh's intention was against them to come and destroy them. Fear never lacks a little bit of the dramatic, right? Fear assumes they're going to die. We are going to die, right? You have people in your life that are this way, right? When they see something and they go into panic mode, they think of the worst scenario that could possibly happen, and that's what's about to take place for us. Well, that's what they did. And so they started in this enormous fear in their life, and then this event takes place, this God event takes place, and then we're back concluding about fear in their life again. So there's something to learn about fear here. But let me just pull on this subject of fear for a moment. Um, what, you know, what exactly is fear? Is, is, it, a, is it a bad thing? I mean, it, it often just, it just feels like a bad thing, right? It's, it's anxious. It's disturbing. Is it something that we are to be avoiding at all costs, right? I mean, Christians and fear, 
we, sh- we should just shouldn't have any fear. We, the fear should not be in our lives, right? Here's a definition for fear. It says, an unpleasant feeling of anxiety or apprehension caused by the presence or anticipation of danger. Fear can also mean respect or awe for somebody or something, right? In this beginning of the story, their respect and their awe is over Pharaoh. They respect his power. They are intimidated by his chariots and by what he can do to them. So there's fear in that sense for him as well as danger. And there's also a sense where fear can be defined as a, a concern about something that threatens to bring bad news or results. And that's what they thought, right? What's approaching us is going to kill us. So their conclusion is this is a bad thing that's about to happen to us. Well, two quick thoughts on fear because I think it's helpful for us to understand it a little bit. One, fear has a number of qualities and feels to it, right? When we engage and experience fear, right, there is a category of fear that feels like horror and dread and terror, right, frightening. That's, that's a dimension of fear that can be experienced. There's also a dimension of fear that has respect and awe and reverence and amazement and wonder Something that just, you know, we're amazed by stuff that falls outside of the common, right? You know, you, you know, go play basketball with an average dude and then go play basketball with, you know, like LeBron or something. You, know, you get amazed by things that are unusual. They're outside of what you normally experience and you're amazed by that. There's wonder, how do you do that? Well, there's an element of fear in that. There's also an element of fear that feels like carefulness, caution, and not just, you know, casualness, right? Um, nobody, nobody goes up to the top of a building that's just really right up in the air there, you know, and just does what I'm doing right here, you know. You don't just walk to the edge and kind of, you know, you're at 80 stories in the air, I promise you, you're not, so what's up? You know, hanging on the edge there. So what's going on down there in the street? Oh, what are those guys doing? There's something about the edges of buildings that, I don't, I don't know what it is. It's like my, my leg grows its own set of brains. And, I, you know, one, part of me is fighting getting anywhere near the thing. Like, if I can fall over and reach the edge, I'm too close. You know, even if I'm not going to fall off. But it's like my legs, like, want to jump, though. You know, it's like, yeah, you have that weird feeling? It's like, if I get too close, my legs are like, jump, jump. It's like, what the heck? <laughs> so... Heights are a weird experience for me. Uh, Second, things that we fear reveal where we believe power is located. This is important because fear operates in us. Things that we are afraid of, we fear them because we believe they have power in them. Power to do something to us. So we've got phobia fears in the room here today. You know, I'm not sure what your phobia is. Um, I, I, I don't think I have a lot of phobias, but you know, there are some things in my life that I just, I just kind of don't want to get near. I do, I do have one that just sits like a phobia, and I never had a fear of small spaces until the house we lived in on Cena Drive had a really low-pitched roof, and I was crawling around in the attic one day. And it was hot, you know, and my attics are always hot, but it's New Orleans hot. And I was having to fish a wire down the wall, so I had to crawl to the edge where the roof came really close to the wall. And so there was like no space, and there was a lot of junk, and I had to crawl over stuff. And out of nowhere, this sense of panic came over me. It was hot. I felt like I couldn't breathe. I realized it will take me at least half a day's journey to get to the attic exit. Uh, just, it took me a while to get over here, and I knew I, I can't get out of here. And I'm having this argument with myself. You can breathe. You're okay. My body is going, we're not okay. We have to get out of here now. I don't think you understand the seriousness of this. It was like a panic. And ever since that day, if you stick me in a small space, something on the inside of me goes off like a doot, doot, doot. <laughs> uh, this is not good. And I have to kind of fight through that. But I've, you know, I've got other stuff in my life that I'm just, I'm, I'm respectfully afraid of, right? I, I don't find, like things that bite. 
right? Critters that bite. If you got teeth, you have my attention. Um, <laughs> you will not find me walk into your house and find your cat cute and pick him up. I just won't do it. Um, even if the cat looks like he's in a good mood and likes everybody. Well, cats for me are kind of like electronics. There's demons assigned to me in cats. So I know that cat is kind of like, he's checking me out when I walk in the room. You know, he's got that tail thing going on. He's nice to everybody else, but on the inside, you all know this, cats are unpredictable. I mean, unlike any other pet that you can have, they have their own agenda. They don't respect you. They are using you. Unlike your dumb dog, I mean, dogs are just loyal and, oh, hey, I'm here, I'm for you, what you want? <laughs> They're not going to bite you. But a cat, at any moment, could just decide to just launch into you. That's what I believe about cats. So I'm not going to hold your cat. It's just built into me. I have a respectful fear of cats or anything. It's got teeth that's unpredictable. Uh, needles, I don't care for needles. You know, just the whole, I can't watch somebody get a shot. It's like... No, no. So this just built in, and all of us kind of got these categories where something rises up in us with this strong feeling like, whoa, that could hurt me. And then you got other categories you've got to live in that fear hangs out in as well. You, you got people fears, right? Uh, you know, number one fear of humanity is not dying, it's public speaking. Right, there's something about standing in front of people that is just terrifying, and we don't want to do it. So, I mean, I, I know this, because anytime we ever ask anybody to do something, it's like, you, you, could, you could have a testimony about God raising you from the dead, and if we asked you to share it in front of the church, you'd be like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> Look, <laughs> I mean, I, I know I was really, really dead, and it was pretty amazing that God raised me up, but... Jeez, could you read it for me? I mean, it's like, it's terrifying, right? And there, but there's other dimensions of, of relating to people that you can just be afraid of new people. You can be afraid of large groups. You can be afraid of being rejected, of not being accepted. And that stuff will just boil up in you in a major way, kind of like here comes the Egyptian chariots and oh my gosh, we are, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. If I've got to go do that with those people, I'm going to die. And that's in us. It's this response of fear or, or circumstances come into our lives. I mean, we get in touch with fear when the economy changes, right? I mean, I, I know this. I'm, I'm watching economic news that I know affects some of you guys in this room. You know, we live in New Orleans. We are probably some of the few people on the planet who don't celebrate the thought that the price of oil could go lower, Right? Now, maybe you do, and it's only because you don't care about the people in this room who work in the oil industry. Uh, but, you know, people who service the oil industry, they own businesses that service the oil industry, their, their jobs are based in, or maybe they work for the government that gets quite a bit of its revenue from higher oil prices. So when, you know, oil prices keep tanking like they are, I read an article the other day that somebody thought oil could go down to $15 a barrel. What? Now, hey, gas will be really cheap, but... There's a bunch of people in this room that every time oil goes down lower, fear increases in their life. Because they, am I going to get laid off? Am I going to lose my job? If I keep my job, can I make any money at this anymore? Right? So those are real legitimate fears. Um, terrorist acts are everywhere giving fear. Terrorist acts are becoming not just strange events in the Middle East. They're, they're becoming neighborhood events, aren't they? And how many of you guys, uh, if you go to a movie... I've never done this before. I did it the, uh, when we were on vacation. We went to a movie. I watched every person who walked into the theater. And, you know, if, any, you know, if some guy looking a little suspect had walked in alone, I don't know what I'd have done. You know, the one guy that looked suspect to me was, was with his wife or his girlfriend. So I thought, nah, he's not going to shoot everybody with his girlfriend here. I mean, come on. They don't do that. They're alone. But there's just fears in us that we interact with life. And, and here's, here's what happens. We start believing that these things have power over us. They have the power to harm us. They have the power to affect our health, our well-being, our future, our income, the life that our income can provide for us. So, so fear has got to be connected to the belief that whatever that thing is, it has power in my life, right? So I think I wrote this in your outline. Fear is such a powerful thing in us that we greatly notice it can never be, can even be obsessed with it, and some think we need to get rid of fear altogether, right? It feels bad 
to even have fear going on in our lives. But let me just tell you this. Actually, when we look today at how God deals with fear, fear's not a bad thing. But you do have to understand how it's operating in your life and where you're finding it. Right? So if I, you know, you guys remember the, the days back when Cold War radioactivity was, you know, possible radioactive activities, dirty bombs and all this kind of stuff. And they had this little device, it's called a, a Geiger counter. You guys know what a Geiger counter is? So it detects radioactivity. And so, you know, this Geiger counter, you turn it on and then, you know, it gets over here by something radioactive and starts coming to life, you know. You know that thing right there is radioactive and you point it over here and it's all right, that thing's radioactive. Well, fear is like a Geiger counter for us. When fear makes its noise in our life, it's because it's pointing at something that we believe has power over us. Our future, we believe, our future is in the hands of that thing that we're pointing the Geiger counter, the fear counter at. And so that's what the Egyptians were for the Israelites, right? They woke up one day and pointed their Geiger counter at this onslaught of chariots and horsemen and Pharaoh and that thing came to life and the fear started leaping out of them and making them some Geiger counter noises to them and they went into a panic because they believed those people, their agenda has power over us. What kind of power? We're going to die kind of power. It's going to be over for us. So here's the challenge, because I, I know fear is such an awkward feeling thing that we love to get rid of it. Let me just break some news to you today. You will never get rid of fear this side of heaven. And even in heaven, you will have a form of it that you should have. So fear is not a bad thing, right? Here's the reason you can never get rid of fear is because you will always recognize you don't have total control or power over your life and something else does. No matter what you try to do to make fear go away, at some point in the back of your mind, you know you do not have total control and power over your life and something else does. everybody in here, this is, you know, this is not a time. Let's all have a negative confession together. Uh, does everybody recognize that at some point you are going to get a bad health report? Do you recognize that? Now you, you may be, you know, batting a thousand. I mean, you've just lived a healthy, healthy, healthy life. You know, other people have had some issues, but for you, you've just cruised through life healthy, 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 healthy. So you've got a history that kind of leads you to believe that, hey, Tomorrow is going to be healthy too, and the next day is going to be healthy as well. Um, not necessarily, right? I mean, I, I have been a picture of health in my life. I was one of those kids who got perfect attendance in school. Uh, I just never sick. I just had an immune system that just jumped all over whatever came along, and I just was seldom ever sick. I seldom had almost any issues. I played sports. I had seldom had injuries. I think I missed a couple of games for a finger issue and, a, and an ankle issue once. I just was healthy. And then I hit my mid-40s. And most of you guys have known me during that time. And, I've, you know, I've had to sit down to preach. My leg propped up. I've had to have operations, multiple of them. I got told I had cancer at some point. So all of a sudden, I was on a hot streak all these years. And the notice came in that said, Keith, you don't have control over your health. You don't have the power to make your health stay on track for the rest of your life. And even if you can treat something or take some medicine that helps, there's coming a day when you are going to die. That day is in everybody's future. Death will have a say-so over you. Whether you want it to or not, it will come with power and you will not be able to resist it or make it go away. But there's lots of stuff in your life that you don't have control and power over. I mean, you recognize, hopefully you're recognizing, you don't have control and power over the people in your life. Now, now some of you think you can control the people in your life. Some of you just do a really good job of working 24-7 at controlling the people in your life. But you don't have control over them. 
you can fall out of favor with them. Everybody in this room's got former friends. Everybody in this room's got people that you never thought would have done what they did, but they did what they did. And you had to live in the fallout of what's happened. You've got family members that are that way, that you thought would, would never treat you the way that they treated you, and, and they did. And once you've gotten exposed to a few people that way, you kind of start looking around at the other people going, hmm, I wonder when he's going to or she's going to. Oh, yeah, you're my friend now, but because you look just like that one over there who did this to me. And you start right now, you don't have control and power over some things. So there's no way that you can, you can self-remedy fear. But God has a remedy for fear. And it's really not a, an eradicating of fear as much as it is a relocating of our fear. And that's what this story in Exodus does. Exodus introduces us as something that can feel a little strange, uh, almost even inappropriate. Exodus has a lot to say about fearing God. And that doesn't sound like we should fear God. Why would we fear God? And does the Bible really say much about that? Well, listen, in the day and age in which we live, maybe more so than other generations that any of our family or ancestors would remember, you know, we live in a day that has given itself permission to do this to God. There is a God out there, and I will take a slice of this end of him, and I will not take the rest of him. So the slice that is in our culture today is, is we like a God who is loving and to be loved, who is kind and patient, who is, does, you know, a God that doesn't have too much of an opinion about things, a God who cares a God who will come run and bring to us comfort and we will feel comforted by this God. But we don't have a category for fearing God. That's not something that we're comfortable with. And I don't know if you've noticed, if you've been a Christian for a while or you just pay attention to bumper stickers, you're going to notice that there is a change in verbiage going on in the Christian universe. Right? You can play along with me on this one. God is good. All right. Did you know that that's, that's, that's kind of a catchy thing that years ago, that's true, it just wasn't so catchy. And it wasn't so popular. Right? 30 years ago, a much more popular bumper sticker said, Jesus saves. Y'all remember that one, you older people? Remember that? Billboards, Jesus saves. Just those two words, Jesus saves. Bumper stickers, people talking, Jesus saves. Today, you don't hear that. Nobody's got a, I bet nobody in this room has got a bumper sticker on their car that says Jesus saves. Might have one that says God is good all the time. See, now the only problem with that is good is such a vague term. And you can define it to be kind of whatever you'd like it to be. It's kind of, and when today it's good for whatever you think is good. So God is good. He doesn't interfere and he doesn't have opinion and he's kind of a lightened up and he's taken, you know, a sort of a sedative and he's chilled out a little bit. He's good. Hey, what, what does that even mean, God is good? But Jesus saves? Now that's two words with some edges on it. That's not popular today. Because to, to say Jesus saves is to imply that there are people who need to be saved. And why would we need to be saved? Well, because as Eric was leading us through some songs this morning... There is this sin component in us that we need to be saved because of our sin and we need to be saved from the penalty of our sin. And where is that penalty going to come from? Let me just tell you, it's not going to come from your neighbor. It's not going to come from the most well-behaved human being on the planet who gets to punish everybody else. It's not going to come from the devil. The penalty comes from God. So Jesus saves implies that there is a God to whom we are accountable and we need to be saved from him and to him. Our culture doesn't want to say that. Our culture wants nothing to do with that. They're, 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 you're going to have to go back to the 70s and 80s to maybe find a bumper sticker on Jesus saves. I even heard a guy the other day 
I respect this man. He, is a, he has shared the gospel all over the world, so I, I, just, I just have respect for him. But he was on a national news program, and he was being interviewed from a challenging angle, and what he said was, what he, it was a little bit of a softening up of something. He said, what, what the world needs is the love of God. That's what he said. What the world needs is the love of God. Now, I, I won't debate with anybody on that. The world does need the love of God, but the world is fine with having the love of God. He talked to the most lost uninterested in God person that there is, and they will be fine with the love of God. But, you know, when I open the Bible up, the Bible doesn't present this idea that you can slice off this piece of God. I'll have a, I'll have a slice of the love God. No, 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 the rest of it you can just leave. And it would serve it up. You know, here's God. He, he's a God who loves. And you need God's love in your life. Well, you do need God's love in your life. But did you know you needed forgiveness from God. I do need the love of God. I need the forgiveness of God as well. I, I need the wisdom of God in my life. I need the power of God in my life if I'm going to live this life. Right? So the, the Bible doesn't present slices of God that you get to pick and choose. The Bible just presents God and the message of the Bible is I need God. I, I don't need a concept or a slice of a concept. I need the being who embodies all these concepts. But he is all of them. And I need him. And in this passage today, he's a God to be feared. You really want to do an interesting little study here, right? This is the benefit of studying through a book verse by verse. We are 14 chapters into Exodus. If we were to keep score here, and I don't suggest you do this because the Bible's not looking for you to compile stats like this, okay? But if we were to keep score on the love of God versus the fear of God in Exodus in the first 14 chapters, right? Now, right now, I'm trying to rescue you from saying, oh, gosh, here Keith goes again. Keith, are you ever going to talk about the love of God? <laughs> um, well, I'm studying the book of Exodus with you. And I will talk about it as soon as Exodus brings it up. <laughs> so now listen, I know that's kind of weird and funny, but this is what keeps, you know, we preach through the Bible, it keeps us from creating God the way we want him to be. See, because I could skip this verse, right? If I just want to, you know, if I just want to pull a Joel Osteen here, I can just not, don't preach this verse. Just find a nice verse, Find a tolerant verse. Find a verse where God is patient. And by the way, God is nice, he's kind, he's patient. He's all those things, and I can find verses for that. But if I just walk through Exodus, I bump into this passage, and I have to let it speak to me. So we get to chapter 14 here. Here's the score. Love of God, zero. <laughs> Fear of God, five. It's been mentioned five times so far in the book of Exodus. And the case I want to make for it today is that's not a bad starting place. There's something about correctly understanding the fear of God that's pretty important to sort of opening up all the rest of who God is to us. And, and that, that I'm not trying to make a case for this that the Exodus isn't making because Exodus could have come along and said a lot using phrases that it does use elsewhere. God is love. That's in the Bible. It's just not in the first 14 chapters of Exodus. And not because this, you know, Moses isn't writing going here, wow, I hope I'm giving enough airtime to enough things here. It's just writing as God is leading him to write. And this is how he lays it out for us. Ed Welch says, to fear the Lord is one way we are instructed to respond to God. There are many ways God's called us to respond to him, such as with love, obedience, honor, and trust. Yet, the call to fear the Lord is the most frequently commanded and central response. This thought. Here's what happens when we start slicing God up and leaving out parts of him. If you don't let God be all that he is to you, then you will battle with fearing the wrong things throughout your life. And you'll live under the tyranny of other people, things, circumstances, etc., having power over you. See, there's something about the fear of the Lord that is a rescuing thing for us. 
That's what you see in this story here. And you can like it or not like it, but if you set it aside, you will still have fear in your life. You will just live with it in the wrong place, having not relocated it where it needs to, needs to be and should be and is a good thing if it's there. You will still live with it. And you will live in the fear of people the rest of your life. You will live in the fear of circumstances the rest of your life, of events the rest of your life, of your health the rest of your life because you failed to relocate fear. Well, this passage here, it, it relocates fear, right? It starts off with fear. Look in verse 10. It starts off with fear being condemned. In the beginning, fear is a bad thing because it's, it's located in the wrong place in their lives. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them and they feared greatly. Now, that fear gets spoken to in, in, in verse 13. And Moses said to the people, fear not. Right? That fear right there gets condemned by Moses. The presentation here, the way the scripture picks this up, is that the people of God ought not be looking at approaching armies and be afraid of them. And then when it closes, fear actually is commended. Verse 31, Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians, so the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. So we started with a fear to be condemned, we ended with a fear to be commended in our lives. Interesting, you don't get rescued here. I've heard people try and rescue this fear of the Lord concept by trying to play with the words that get used in the Hebrew language. Um, okay, if, if you'll be fair and you'll look at everywhere the use of fear is in the Old Testament, you're not going to be able to get rescued from what you're trying to get rescued from. You're gonna, you know, you, the temptation is to say, well, you know, well, sure, we're supposed to fear the Lord like this reverential respect. Uh, that's true. But the word that you're using to make that case gets used all over the place for the, all the other kinds of fear as well. Like wet your pants, scared to death fear. It's the same word used elsewhere. The sense of being terrified, being amazed and overwhelmed by something is in the scriptures as well. Feeling threatened by something is in the scripture as well. Same word, it's the word yare. It's a verb meaning to fear, to respect to reverence, to be afraid, to be awesome, to be feared, to make afraid, to frighten, right? A lot of uses for this word. William Mount says, Yare denotes both a sense of terror and a sense of awe and worship. All right, do you have that in your concept that you could possibly be relating to a God who in his being, there's a sense of terror as well as affection and worship, now, maybe that doesn't make sense at a human level, but that's one of the things we have to be careful about, that we don't take our ideas at a human level and then try and place them upon God, right? If, if I, I might be terrified of you because you're, you're, just, you're just weird and, you know, unpredictable, and you just stab somebody in the back of the room and you're walking up toward me. Okay, that's a totally different response because in all that I know about you, unlike in all that I know about God... With God, I can be both terrified and attracted at the same time. Now, if you just stab somebody, you're coming at me with a knife, I got no attraction for you, right? I got a lot of terror going on, but I'm not attracted to you, by the way. If you pointed this, this Geiger counter of fear at people's lives in Scripture, right? This is, this is not just a problem for these Israelites facing an Egyptian army. Right? They pick up the Geiger counter, goes nuts. The fear counter goes off the charts when they see this army coming. And that's the human need. The need to relocate their fear. But they're not alone here. Right? There's lots of folks before them. This word Yari gets used in other places. Genesis 26, 7. When the men of the place asked him, right, speaking of Isaac, about his wife, he said, she is my sister. For he feared to say, my wife, thinking lest the men of the place should kill me because of Rebecca, because she was attractive in appearance. Right, what, what's happening to Isaac in this moment? These men come into his life 
and he's got a good looking wife and he's in a foreign land and he starts thinking, right? And he points that Geiger counter over at these group of men and knows what foreigners are like and he's thinking and filling in the blanks, these guys are going to kill me and take my wife. And his fear monitor goes off like nuts. And whatever he's going to do next, interesting notice, <clears throat> gets dictated by what he's afraid of. That'd be an interesting study to do in your own life. How many actions have you taken based on what you are afraid of? A lot, right? And he does as well. <clears throat> Genesis 31, 31, speaking of Jacob, says, Jacob answered and said to Laban, because I was Yahweh afraid for I thought that you would take your daughters from me by force, right? So Laban's got power over Jacob in this moment because Lab uh, Jacob has something he doesn't want to lose, something precious to him, something valuable to him, and he perceives that person has the power to take by force what matters to me. And so his fear is all over the place. His Geiger counter is making a lot of noise in this moment. A little bit later, Genesis 32, again, then Jacob was greatly afraid, Yare, and distressed. He divided the people who were with him and the flocks and herds and camels into two camps, thinking this. If Esau comes to the one camp and attacks it, then the camp that is left will escape. So in another point in Jacob's life, who is he afraid of? Esau. Esau, my brother, is coming to disrupt my life, to kill people. Esau has the power to affect my world. And so I'm afraid of him, right? Anything you see as powerful in your life, you will be afraid of. And he was. Genesis 43. <clears throat> These are Joseph's brothers. The men were afraid, same word, because they were brought to Joseph's house and they said, it is because of the money which was replaced in our sacks the first time that we are brought in so that he may assault us and fall upon us to make us servants and seize our donkeys. And this, this is full-orbed fear. This is, this is fear in all realms of life. This guy, Joseph, they don't know who he is right now, right? These are the brothers, and, and they're, they're afraid of him because he's got, he's got power in all categories. Our health could be threatened by this guy. He's going to assault us and beat us half to death. So physically, I'm afraid. He's probably more afraid of Joseph than I am of cats. Uh, he's afraid of their future, right? This guy has power over our future. He's going to take our future away. He's going to make us servants, and he's going to take our stuff Right? Fear of losing our stuff. We live in these categories. We don't have any donkeys, but we've got stuff that we're afraid. Somebody out there is going to take the stuff that we have. So our health gets threatened. Our future gets threatened. Our possessions get threatened. This is full-orbed fear. Right? Because these men believe that guy, whoever he is, has power over our lives. And so when you start believing that, fear becomes your experience. Now what's interesting, this same word is used elsewhere in Scripture to describe the fear of the Lord. All over the place. Exodus chapter 1, verse 15, even in the book of Exodus, says, the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared, Yare feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them. This is, this is very insightful, isn't it? This is a glaring example of whatever actions you're going to take in your life, they're based in what you fear. They, for all known reasons, should have been terrified and afraid and feared Pharaoh. And I'm sure they did. But they just seemed to fear God more in such a way that even though that guy, that same guy who's going to come up to them in chariots in a little while and scare them to death, that same guy who has conquered the world, that same guy who is the most powerful individual, I'm sure intimidating individual that ever existed that they could have known, gave them personally a decree 
and they disobeyed it because they feared someone else more than they feared Pharaoh. Right, do, you, do you see where the location of your fear is what matters in your life? It's not as though they had no fear. Well, no, they had fear. Their fear was in God. It was not in this Pharaoh, even though he had the power to perhaps kill them. They feared God more. So I'm going to say this. I think this is a decent principle from these passages. You could say that the story of God's dealings with his people is a story to relocate their fear. Not to eradicate this fear, but to relocate it. Right? And in Exodus, God is relocating where their, their kind of Geiger counter finds greatness and power and things that are fearful. Right? God, is, God is relocating that. You have called that great, and because you think it's great and you think it's powerful, you think it has control over your life, therefore you fear it. That's how we live. And God steps into that in Exodus and says, I'm going to relocate your fear. I'm going to move your fear from where you've been having it parked and I'm going to put it over here. He's not going to eradicate your fear. He's going to er relocate it. Exodus chapter 6. We'll just look at these verses quick. Verse 6. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians and I will deliver you from slavery to them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people and I will be your God and you shall know. Chase down that, that little phrase everywhere you can in the Old Testament. You shall know. They shall know. It's, it's, I won't say it's always used, but it is frequently used to describe God is about to act so that you can be clear about who he is. The prophets use this phrase over and over and over again. I'm about to do this. This is going to come to pass. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. So there's this acting of God. This is why I wanted to draw our attention to what's, what's on either side of this Red Sea event. Why does this Red Sea event take place? So that you may know something about me. And you may pick up your fear from that address and relocate it to this address. And that's what he does here. I will be your God that you shall know I am the Lord your God. Exodus 7 verse 5. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. The Egyptians are about to get a new address for greatness and for powerful and for what is to be feared in this world. Exodus 14, 4, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them and I will get glory over Pharaoh. You're impressed by Pharaoh? You think Pharaoh's a tough guy? Pharaoh runs the universe? Nobody more respected than him? Okay, notch it up a little higher and you'll come find me. That's what God says. <clears throat> I'm going to harden his heart. <clears throat> He's going to act in the hardness of his heart and then I am going to show you that I exceed him in my power. What does that do for us? Well, you're scared to death of that Pharaoh because he's got some kind of power and you think he's got power over your life. Let me just show you where the power is. And God puts on display his acts. And, and then Romans 9 offers a bit of a commentary for this. It says, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Okay, what, what does Pharaoh provide the opportunity for? Well, Pharaoh provides us with the opportunity to be impressed by something and then to have what we're impressed by adjusted. You know, Pharaoh's not your average dude, right? He is, he's the ultimate ruler with power and authority and influence. And God raises him up in order to say, but he's, he's nothing in comparison to me. If you are afraid of him, you need to relocate your fear. And that's exactly what God does, right? I'll give you a glimpse ahead here. Turn to Exodus chapter 20. Apparently, adjusting fear is, is a major issue. It matters to us whether or not we see God in a way that causes our response to be, wow, wait, be cautious, off the charts, can't explain, oh my gosh. It matters whether that's what we bring to God. Because let me just tell you, if you don't bring that to God, I promise you, you will not trust him, you will not follow him, you will not believe in him. 
And isn't it crazy? You'll, you'll follow the kooky ideas of your neighbor three houses down. Of some kid in eighth grade who shared something with you that stuck with you. And where is he today? Unemployed. I don't know. <clears throat> but he said something that just, yeah, I'm going to grow up and be X, Y, or Z. This is the God of the universe. Stands and says, if you don't see me above everything else, you are not going to believe me. And that's what this says, right? At the end of the story here, they feared the Lord and they believed. They feared and they believed. Fearing God has something to do with whether you're ever going to believe him. Verse 18. Right, and that we're, we've fast forwarded here, right? They're no longer traveling through the wilderness. They finally arrived at Mount Sinai. They've gathered around this holy mountain to meet with God as a nation. Now, when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were yare, afraid and trembled, and they stood far off. <clears throat> this is them coming to have a meeting with God. This is God, nice to meet you, Israel, in this moment. They show up at a mountain. The mountain begins to freak out right in front of them. There is smoke. There is fire. There is this strange darkness around it. There's something that sounds like trumpet sounds coming out of this thing. All right, this is, somebody needed to put a barbed wire fence around this thing and put high voltage on it and just let you listen to the hum. Y'all ever listen to the hum of some of this high voltage? I, I have a fear of electricity as well. I have to confess that. I'm, I'm not going to play with that. Right? I'll touch a battery, you know, the little square ones. I might even put it on my tongue just for fun. But don't even put me near a wall outlet. I'm not going there. So they come to this mountain. It's smoking. The people were afraid and trembled and they stood far off and said to Moses, Moses, how about this? You speak to us. We will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Right, this is Yare, right? This is like, I think we're going to die. Fear. Moses said to the people, do not fear. For God has come to test you that the fear of him may be before you that you may not sin. All right, here's an event. Now listen, let me just tell you something. God does not show up this way in everybody's life. Right? You know, the, the, the Samaritan woman the woman, at the, the woman at the well doesn't meet God this way. And so this is not the only image of God. But this is an intentional image that God imparted to these people. This is fear by design. God doesn't have to show up and rumble things and fire and smoke and trumpet sounds so that people go, back up, back, oh my gosh, what is this? Back up, back kids, back up. This is not safe. Moses, I don't know what to do with this. Why don't, why don't you talk to God? Just come tell us what we say. We don't want God to talk to us. This is terror, right? Don't, don't, this is not reverential awe. This is, oh my gosh, get us away from this. This is, this is going to blow up. And there's a realm in which God exists that feels that way to people who have understanding about this big. Look, I, I don't fully understand electricity. That's why I'm afraid of it. And I don't fully understand God. So there's a, there's a, there is a sense of, whoa, going on in this passage that God intended for them to experience. And you know, <laughs> Charles Spurgeon, is only Charles can say, he says, if the giving of the law, this is introducing them to the law, if the giving of the law, while it was yet unbroken, was attended with such a display of awe-inspiring power, what will that day be when the Lord shall with flaming fire take vengeance on those who have willfully broken his law? If you think this is a bad day, You know, there's a reason why the Bible uses some weird-sounding language. It is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Listen, just encountering God by his very nature is fear-inspiring. Because of the nature of who we are, the limitation of who we are, and the nature of who God is, right? I'm not going to read this passage. You can go back and look at it. But you guys know the story, right? In Mark chapter 4... All the disciples get in the boat with Jesus. They begin to cross the, the sea. And they're going to the other side. 
And along the way, this incredible storm comes up. And it had to have been an incredible storm because these guys were fishermen. And they're not afraid of a little breeze here. And they get out on the, on the water and the storm is so bad that they're convinced they're going to die, right? So the Bible says they were afraid. All right, and this is the New Testament, so it doesn't want to use the Hebrew word. But they were afraid because of this storm that came. And Jesus is sleeping in the back of the boat, right? You remember this? And so they wake him up. Jesus, don't you care? We're all about to die. Jesus questions their faith and says, oh, you little faith. <laughs> and he just speaks to this storm, rocking the boat, giant waves crashing over, wind, lightning. And he just says, peace be still. And all of a sudden, all the waves chill out. The boat stops moving. Clouds are gone. Lightning is over. Now, they were afraid before. Now, go back and read the story because now it says they were exceedingly afraid. <laughs> right? They just had their fear relocated. We thought the storm had power over us, but you have power even over the storm. We were afraid of that. And if you're greater than that, whoo, we're more afraid of you. And that is the right response. Jonah has an interesting similar story. Right, you can read those two passages there. But remember Jonah's story. They get caught in a storm. Jonah's down below deck. These guys get convinced. They're afraid. They say, yare, they're afraid. We're going to die. They start throwing stuff overboard from the ship, trying to, to lighten the load so they can survive this thing. And then Jonah makes them aware that, hey, the problem here is, is I'm running from Yahweh. I'm running from the one true God. And your only hope is to throw me overboard. And so they... They pitch him overboard. Now, they were afraid before, and they pitch him overboard, right? You see that in verse 16? And, and all of a sudden, the storm just dies in an instant. Same sort of a scenario. It says, then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. They were afraid before, but now they're exceedingly afraid. Right? When, when this, is, this is the whole purpose of God introducing us to the need to relocate what we call powerful. What was the difference between David meeting Goliath and all the Israelites who were scared to death to do the same thing? They were afraid of Goliath. David was afraid of God. So what did he do? He picked up some stones, walked right out there. <laughs> I don't know who you are. I just know who God is. His fear wasn't in a giant. His fear was in God. Right? Remember the great clash between Jesus and Pilate? And Pilate... A man who, he is used to everybody being afraid of him. He's the final word on whether you live or you die. So he's used to people being scared of him. Jesus comes before him and shows no fear. He's totally at peace. Puzzling, Pilate asked him. Do you understand what's going on here, dude? Do you know I have the right to kill you? And Jesus said what to him? You would have no power over me unless my Father in heaven who is over you had given it to you. See, I, I have a fear of the one who's in charge of all power, not the ones who seek to use it against me. All right, this, this is a relocation of fear. Ed Welch says, if you really want to fight fear, learn to fear someone who captures your attention in such a way that your other fears suddenly seem pedestrian and unimportant. Listen, everybody else who faced Pharaoh, uh, Pilate was scared to death. Jesus was not. Now, let me just say this quickly. The fear of God, it may sound strange, but it's a good starting place. Exodus presents it that way, right? This Exodus curriculum was, was, has a featuring element of relocating their understanding of power and things that were to be feared. Right? Proverbs 9, verse 10 says this. The fear of of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. <clears throat> Accurately understanding God is insightful. <clears throat> the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If I've got no fear of God, then everything else in the world can't make sense to me correctly because I am locating power somewhere else besides in the one who has ultimate power and authority over everything. 
And so if I don't have God in the picture, I've got authority and power somewhere else in this world. And therefore, I'm not a wise person. I have, I have misdefined life in that moment. And, you know, Exodus is people kind of getting introduced to some things about God. So in the curriculum of God here, it's not like God says, ooh, ooh, fear of God. Hey, let's spend like all of first grade in the love of God and then maybe we'll move on to grace and mercy in second grade. We'll get to third grade and we'll just slowly introduce righteousness, but we won't want to move too fast. And then maybe when they get to grad school, we'll talk about fear of God because that just sounds so weird. Can you follow with me? In Exodus, in first grade, they get introduced to the fear of God. Now, listen, I know that I might not be the consultant God wants in the curriculum-based stuff that he's doing here. But apparently, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of a lot of things. It's what enables us to get some things right. Ed Welch says, the fear of the Lord is not for specialists who focus on one attribute of God to the exclusion of others. It is prized throughout Scripture because it is such a mature response to God. It comes when we know that God is King, Lord, and Father. He is the high and exalted one as well as the suffering servant. He both hates sin and delights in forgiving sinners. Right? You've you got to be able to think in a little bit more than one category and say, well, if, I, if I'm thinking fear, I'm not thinking love anymore. Well, this God is all of that at the same time. So you can't slice off a piece and have a piece of God and then think you're understanding him. You can't do that. He is all of this. Right? Look at these verses here. Look at the word mixture here. Deuteronomy 10. This is characteristic of many verses in the Old Testament. Verse 12, now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord which I'm commanding you today for your good. Fear is not a bad thing in this passage. Fear leads to good. And by the way, fear gets mentioned before love does in this passage. The angel of the Lord, Psalm 34, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. Now, look at the words that are mixed together here. You have this sense of fear of God in the same passage with good. It is good. You are, God is good. You are blessed. And you take refuge in him. See, you can fear God and run toward him in the Bible. Now, I know in human understanding, because of the way we use the term and what we understand about it, we run away from the things that we fear. But in the Bible, when we see God for who he is, we run toward him. Because though he is powerful and terrifying and freaks us out, he is at the very same time patient and loving and kind and merciful. It's not like he's got a day where, okay, on Tuesday I'm scary. And then on, on Wednesday I'm like calm and I've chilled out. You know, and then if, as long as the saints play well on Monday, I'm in a pretty good mood too. You know, that's, that's not God. God is all these things at the same time all the time. That's what can make me go, oh my gosh. Whoa. God, you are so much different than me and I, I'm terrified. I mean, I, 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 I'm overwhelmed with who you are but yet I'm drawn to you all at the same time. And that's how the Bible presents God. Let me just close here with a... Let me, let me just say this, because I know I, you know I used a little phrase there that I kind of like the phrase. Um, fear has to do with things in your life that you believe has power over you. If you don't believe it has any power, you will not be afraid of it, Period. It has to have the ability to touch your life in a way that you are concerned about. And then your little Geiger counter will go off and fear will get expressed. Now, 
The fear of the Lord is not the same as people who just determine in their life, you know what, I've been around people, I've had people mistreat me, and let me just tell you something, I will never give anybody that kind of power over me again. You ever hear people say that? Okay, that's not the fear of the Lord. Your determination that you will not let people produce fear in you anymore, that's not the fear of the Lord. You haven't relocated anything. You just have made your mind up out of your own willpower that you are not going to experience fear. And by the way, you will never escape fear in this world. You will either relocate it to where ultimately you fear God or you will be subject to whatever fear comes knocking on your door in whatever circumstance and people show up and have the ability to threaten your life. All right, let me close with this thought. What, where do we get this fear of the Lord? How do you and I respond to God in such a way that ultimately we're no longer afraid of that? We fear God. I'm released from fearing that and him and this situation. I, I fear God. Ultimately, I recognize God is the ultimate power. He's the ultimate authority. I don't need to be afraid of Pilate or Pharaoh or anybody else. God is ultimately in charge of life and of my life. How, how do I get there? Well, you know, this, this Red Sea moment, and it's, it's what God points to over and over again. I did this that they may know. That they may know. That you may know. The fear of the Lord comes from knowing something about God. If you don't know something about God, you have no grounds upon which to transfer your respect and your awe and your trust to him. So it's pretty important that you know something. And today, I think knowing God is, is on poor ground. For whatever reason, you, you listened to something today. You came here today, and I'm grateful for this time, and I'm always grateful for the time when we gather together and we, we read God's Word and we think through God's Word through preaching. But, but there is a, an experiential level of you experiencing God that creates this sense of fear and awe. It, it cannot just be something that you hear somebody else describe. You, you've got to get close enough to God to want to back away from Him. You've got to come close enough to the mountain of God for you to feel the sense. Not to hear that they felt that sense. That's great. But for you to feel the sense that I think I need to take a couple of steps back here. When you have that experience, something will get written into the genes of your life that makes you think about God differently. And when you get impressed by God, you'll stop being intimidated by everything else. Let me just warn you. So there's a passage in Isaiah. This is, this is it's a warning. Isaiah 29, verse 13. It says, And the Lord said, Because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. Listen, I'm a pastor. I love everybody in this room. If I could yell the fear of God into you, I'd be yelling in your face right now. If I could hit you with something and give you the fear of God, I'd hit you. But I can't command you to fear God. I can't command my children to fear God. I can't command another human being to fear God. I can't teach you into the fear of God and corner you with arguments about the fear of God. You've got to experience God to get the fear of God. And beware, you're living in a land of Christianity that has a very, very, very low experience of God. And therefore, you're living in a land that has a very, very small fear of God. Because they just ain't gotten around him. Listen, this, this is not bad. I'm not trying to, man, oh man, this is heavy. You know what's heavy in your life? The fact that you fear that thing over there and that person over there and that news item over there and that health report over there. That's what's heavy in your life. The fear of the Lord would lighten your load in all those categories. It's not the fear of God that's the heavy subject. It's, it's living life without the fear of God. 
That's the heavy subject. So this is, what a graceful thing this is today. That God has given us a way to relocate our fear and to get liberated from those things that have been so threatening and make us cry out in a panic about our lives. Let's stand up together. All right, you and God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a few things here, but I just want you to listen for the Spirit to commune with you and to speak to you. And my question for us is, what do you fear today? What is suddenly approaching your life like Pharaoh's army and you lift up your eyes and you see that and you are thrown into a panic. You are full of fear. Right? The Geiger counter of fear is going off when you point it at what in your life? Is it when you point it at your health? You have great concerns, diagnosis, symptoms, and you are full of fear about your health. Is it your money? You point it at your bank account. You point it at what you can afford, what future you want to have versus the funds that you have. Is it, are you full of fear about the economy? Things that might happen that would affect your job and your future and your work and you point at that and, it, and you're just full of fear. Is it people? I got a lot of kids, so I got a lot of places I can point my fear Geiger counter. And, you know, I'm, I'm like most parents, I'm sure. Um, my well-intended goal, but unbiblical goal, <laughs> is I, I just want to preserve my kids from everything that could harm them. I don't want them to take a step into anything that would harm them. And if they look like they're even thinking about possibly reading something about taking a step into harming them. Fear. That's what's going off inside of me. Could be other people in your life, but you know, what is it this morning? You're here this morning, and when you point that thing at something in your life, where do you feel the fear in your life? Well, how do you relocate that fear? Well, their fear went from condemned fear to commended fear when they saw what God did on their behalf. That Red Sea moment when they saw God come through in an impossible situation and they got rescued and delivered. They saw God. Now, does everybody here know what that Red Sea illustrates? It illustrates a people being baptized into Christ. It's an illustration of what Jesus Christ was going to do. That great act above all other acts that God steps in and does for us. We were hemmed in by mountains. We were threatened by enemies. And there was no way out in our lives. And there was no hope that any of us could ever be restored to the living God. And I stare at this event called the cross. And I watch God do a miracle on my behalf. And what is impossible becomes possible. Not because of me, not because I, I did something or I'm smart or I'm good. But because of what God did on my behalf, he stepped in and did something for me that I never could have done for myself. And whatever it is that I'm afraid of gets trumped by that. That God is my God. And do I need to be afraid of pharaohs in my life? His armies and chariots? No. Do you need to be afraid of the health conditions that are in your life? Remember, your health is going to change throughout your life. It's not going to stay pretty all the time. Your finances are going to change. The people in your life are going to come and go in your life. People that you are connected to and attached to 
are going to depart from your life and fear is going to scream at you in that moment and you're going to have to decide do do I fear the future of my life that this would bring me harm or do I fear God who is over my life and therefore I trust him he who didn't spare his own son but delivered him up for us all how will he not with him give us all things I'd love to believe that I can preach for an hour and relocate every ounce of fear in this room. I would love to believe that. I know it's going to take a little bit more work than that. It takes more work than that for me. My fears come back. They show up again tomorrow. I, I can get convinced of what God has done and then I can forget. This, this was going to be the fear of God and the forgetfulness of man was going to be the title for this but I've taken long enough just with the fear of God so we decided not to do that but how about this morning do, do, you, do you understand the concept of relocating your fear this morning All right, well let's let's pray let's get quiet with God just for a moment let's let's do that be honest with God tell God what it is that you have been fearful about confess it to God Cry out to God. Say, God, this is what I've been staring at. This is what I'm afraid is going to happen. Like these Israelites, I feel like I'm going to die or this situation is going to die or this relationship is going to die or my job is going to die. Lord, I'm afraid of that. But God, I recognize today If I'm going to fear anything, God, I'm to fear you. I'm to look to you, to hope in you. I'm to trust you. You with all your power that makes me take two steps back also makes me run to you as a father and as a refuge and a covering. The one who will protect me in the day of trouble. The one who will go before me. The one who routes my enemies. Lord, in this story, you cause your people to see enemies floating up on the seashore. The ones that they thought just a few moments earlier were going to kill them have been overthrown by you, Lord. That's who you are, God who's faithful to your people, that there will never be a day that an enemy can overthrow our lives. For they would have no power at all were it not for you giving them a little bit. And ultimately, Lord, you are the God of power. And so this morning, Lord, we transfer our fear, Lord. We pick it up from the address where it's been living and the things that we have been concerned about and we relocate that fear to you, Lord. You have our respect. We are amazed at what you have done and what you will do. God, we call to mind your faithfulness. The God of the impossible comes through and you will yet do that again in our lives, God. We transfer our fear to you, Lord, to you and you alone. Welcomed in to the courts of the King. I've been ushered in to your presence. Lord, I stand on your merciful ground. Yet with every step, tread with reverence. And I fall face down. As your glory shines around And I fall face down As your glory shines around Who is there? Who is there in the heavens like you? upon 
the earth who's your equal you're far above you're the highest of heights we are bowing down to exalt you